um, the, the home ground to the US. Uh, so we will be um, doing a, a short introduction on, on what controversy themes uh, you would be looking at, but also what, what is uh, the definition of an intangible. I think that, uh, that will be different for uh, different people and people with different backgrounds. Then um, we will dive into uh, workshops. Uh, the, the first work workshop is on, on the onshoring of intangibles. The second is on what portion of the uh, value chain in terms of value does, uh, does relate to the intangibles. Again, a definitional uh, challenge. And um, last but not least, uh, there will be a, uh, a session on, on a few court cases uh, as as another breakout, uh, with that I I think the uh, the, the the notion of um, uh, the the notion of uh, uh, the blueprint on pillar one obviously takes amount A as the excessive portion of the residual. So we we're, we're going to talk about the, the bigger portion of the residual today. And I'd like to give the floor to uh, Maria. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, yeah, I would like to start with maybe something that you would consider basic, but I think it's important. Uh, so what is an intangible? I think all of us would have an answer to this question, but we would all have a different answer. And that is because if you uh, look at intangible as a professional, you can act as accountant, you can act as a consultant, you can be a lawyer, and uh, you would all have a different definition and you would all be right. And to avoid that, uh, quite some time ago, uh, Steve created this matrix and called it IPR matrix. And what it helps to see is that uh, in every sphere you have a different definition and that uh, has a label. So for example, a patent or a brand or a trademark, it's identification. Uh, you see a logo and then you recognize that this is a brand. It's uh, the ownership question. So who is the owner? And that is, can be a registration, but also can be the density functions, as we know in transfer pricing. And last one is valuation, which again can be different from perspective of uh, different professionals. And uh, depending on this uh, answer, you would either say that something is intangible or not an intangible. And uh, when it's all in isolation, that sounds so good, but in reality, you constantly have clashes between the definitions. And my simple recent example is I was doing an analysis for a very straightforward limited risk distributor, which doesn't have any intangibles, is not supposed to have for me as a transfer pricing professional. However, uh, what happened when I looked at the balance sheet of this company, it's at intangibles and quite a big amount, which I was really surprised. And I started asking questions to the client, like, yeah, you should not have intangibles, right? And what it appeared is that for accountants, goodwill was an intangible, and this is what they put on the balance sheet and documented. And yeah, then the auditor audited it and put a stamp on it. And everybody, and they agreed that this is an intangible. And they did not uh, put any further explanation, they just said intangible. They didn't say, what is it exactly? So only after asking the question, what is it? A goodwill, okay, so from transfer pricing perspective, according to recent guidelines, if the goodwill is not tied to any other uh, intangible, then it's not an intangible. So we're still good back to our limited risk distributor. But this kind of situations, yeah, they happen a lot. And uh, also, for example, when you have a, a clash between tax and uh, customs or tax and uh, antitrust lawyers, you definitely uh, would have similar situations where you would consider something intangible and the other professional not. And also you can have, uh, yeah, controversy about how to value it and if it has value at all, for example. Uh, so, yeah, I guess th this kind of situation all of us have seen in professional life, but I think it's, it's good to remember that when we will be going for our today's discussion, that it all starts with definition. And if we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, can I, Maria, can I yeah. make uh, a sure. few comments? Uh, just uh, bankruptcy is sometimes very hard for people to 
understand, but there's the Nortel case uh, where Nortel went bankrupt and there was a whole uh, dialogue on which intangibles belonged to which shareholders. There was a European group of shareholders, an American group of shareholders. So there was a whole, um, um, a whole uh, court case about what intangibles belongs on what, what, what balance sheet with different shareholders. Um, antitrust, uh, the Microsoft uh, views of, uh, of their intangibles in, uh, in the antitrust case in the EU is an example. Typically, IP law is the very narrow definition of, uh, of intangibles. Um, all of these have in common that they all use the four functional uh, variables. So they all give it a label. They all can explain how to identify it. Typically, uh, we, we call uh, uh, intangibles as hard to, uh, hard to identify, but uh, the, just one example is a swoosh on a Nike shoe, or if you go into an, a, a, a laboratory and there's a, a secret code uh, before you enter, then you know behind that there's probably something people want to protect. Ownership definitions do vary quite widely amongst these uh, six different disciplines. So as, as Maria already indicated, if you start a discussion with anyone on intangibles, you need to agree which of the 24 boxes uh, you use as your starting point because very, uh, very much otherwise you will be lost in translation. So there's four functional variables, there's six disciplines just as an illustration. So if you don't agree, if you meet someone on the street uh, on which um, box you, you will use as a starting point, there's a very high likelihood you, you use the same terms, uh, which means something different, or you use different terms, which means the same. Uh, so this is the lost in translation game when you talk about intangibles. Maria, back to you. Yeah. Um, next slide, please. So the second point, which uh, I would like to talk about again to set the scene, uh, is that uh, once you agree on the definition of intangibles, you also need uh, to see how it fits uh, within several dimensions. Uh, and the first dimension is your uh, holistic total value chain. Uh, the second one is your transactional, so very narrow view on the uh, intangible. And the third one uh, can be the valuation. So to give a more specific example, uh, if you think uh, on this picture uh, of a brand, uh, so you definitely charge uh, a royalty for this brand, so that's the transaction of you. And uh, the percentage that you charge for the royalty uh, should fit within the total value chain. So uh, you cannot charge, let's say, 15% for the brand because uh, then it would eat up uh, the whole profit uh, of the value chain, but you only should charge uh, something that fits uh, within the total profit and then uh, remunerate basically the value that this brand creates. Uh, and secondly, you need to see that if you do evaluation, how the uh, value of, of the brand that, that you determine, how it ties uh, to the multiple years uh, of income uh, in the terms that if you value it uh, too high uh, and then it's uh, maybe more than the value of your total value chain or even the value of the total enterprise, that, of course, doesn't make sense, and then the evaluation is probably wrong. Uh, so then, we, yeah, you need to take this into account, and you need to see how it uh, ties together. So once you have this, uh, yeah, three dimensions, um, matching and linking, uh, then, then you can more or less rely on the numbers that you got and, and then present it for the tax authorities, for example. Steve, do you want to add anything here? Um, yeah, the, if, 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 uh, if your value chain, uh, your whole value chain makes 10% and, and your brand makes uh, five, uh, so half of the, uh, the income you're making is uh, allocable to your brand, uh, that's, that's one uh, position. Uh, that's the top position, as, uh, as you indicated, Maria. Uh, then if, if that 5% uh, is uh, 
a percentage of sales and you uh, earn that income over multiple years, uh, you can do a discounted cash flow and suddenly you have a brand value. Um, and, and, and I think the, the essence, what, what we see is sometimes people start with uh, just throwing cash flows on a, on a spreadsheet and do, cal do a calculation without putting it in the, the right uh, context. And, and that leads to all sorts of uh, discussions. So uh, one of my clients recently did a valuation and came up with, um, uh, with 50 million of, of value while uh, their, um, um, their market cap was, uh, was uh, 60 million. Well, you know, then you have a certain ratio uh, you need to take into account. And, and then basically if you then come up with a valuation of 50 million and the, the whole enterprise is worth uh, uh, 60, then obviously all the other elements of activities you're doing are only worth the 10. Well, is that a realistic proposition? So putting things into also quantitative into the relevant perspective, I think is what this uh, slide is, uh, is indicating. Yeah, uh, next slide please. Yeah, this is uh, pretty heavy stuff uh, for uh, for a Thursday afternoon. So, so what we're doing here is we, we it's just an application of what we just were saying. We 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 look at the operating enterprise value, and we take three approaches. We take the uh, historical cost. Uh, we take the income approach and the um, uh, multiples approach. Typically, multiple means you you take the earnings before interest and tax times a multiplier to get to the um, enterprise-wide uh, value. Um, and and in this particular case, we we have analyzed uh, three software packages, uh, the value of three software packages, which were transferred between two group companies. And we wanted to make sure that the, the total value of these three software packages was not exceeding the value of the whole enterprise. So this is a, a fairly simple uh, an analysis where we say, okay, maybe the historical cost is not a good reference for, uh, for, for valuing the enterprise. So we gave it a weight of, uh, of uh, uh, 0%. Uh, the future cash flow, the income approach, was a fair approach to um, calculate the enterprise value. So we gave it a 50% weight, and the multiples was another good, good approach, and we gave it a 50% weight as well. But as a consequence, the, uh, the enterprise value was 18.2 million, um, and uh, the, uh, with the uh, the calculations, uh, we got to a factor uh, of implied goodwill of uh, 17 million. And we had a total fair market value of three software packages. We were moving from a group company A to B of uh, 3.4. Well, obviously in this uh, scenario, the software packages value was uh, in relationship to the total enterprise value 20%. And, and that, that was a whole qualitative analysis to put the things into the right uh, perspective. And so the, the whole question uh, here, uh, we, we have addressed this, why would you put the valuation of three software packages, in this case, uh, the transfer of a source code uh, between two group companies in the context of performing an enterprise valuation. This is uh, sort of important also in uh, various breakout sessions where we we, we always like to keep the numbers uh, straight. And I know that that's, that's sometimes only at the end of the, of the game, once you define what the intangibles really is about. But this is uh, a um, simple example of the picture with all the lights on uh, we showed you before. If there's any questions, uh, please raise them through the chat box. Um, so far, I haven't seen any questions coming up. So with that, uh, next slide. Yeah, 
I would like to yeah, just give brief introduction to the case at hand. Some of you might know it. So uh, Veritas Corporation uh, in 2009 uh, concluded the cost-sharing agreement uh, with its uh, wholly owned subsidiary in Ireland. And uh, pertaining to that cost-sharing, uh, they also asked for the buy-in payment for certain existing intangibles. On top of it, they concluded a research and development agreement and technology license agreement. And uh, within that uh, license agreement, they also provided uh, rights to certain trademarks uh, and uh, uh, service marks uh, to Irish subsidiary. Uh, this uh, whole situation was uh, challenged by the IRS, uh, despite that uh, Veritas US applied uh, existing regs at the point in time, applied cap method. Uh, IRS uh, did not agree uh, and claimed that the uh, combination of intangibles should actually be assessed not on the standalone basis, but rather on the cumulative basis, and that uh, that the uh, yeah the value of the of the total intangibles is actually bigger. So the sum is bigger than the value of each of them. And yeah, if we go to the next slide, please. Yeah, so as I said, uh, I already disputed the valuation and they came up with their own valuation of uh, two and a half billion. Uh, and uh, yeah, this, this case was done in front of the US court. If you would like to continue. Yeah, I think this is an, uh, a, a very illustrative case uh, for a, lo a lot of uh, fights the IRS has been finding itself into, uh, where U.S. companies uh, decided to bring uh, mostly non-U.S. intangibles offshore. Right? So this is the offshoring game, which Hans already alluded on, which, uh, which was still very active uh, until, I guess, the, the, the whole BAPS uh, reports were published and, and it was clear that maybe that was not what uh, the tax authorities uh, would uh, would appreciate anymore. So what, what is happening here um, is th uh, that Veritas put some um, legally protected and protectable uh, IP law components on a train to Ireland. Uh, basically they, they, they said this is uh, the, the, what is really legally protected and protectable. And therefore, um, if we would uh, transfer this to third party, it has a value. Obviously that takes, uh, and that's coming back to our first slide, that takes a very um, legalistic view on what, what is it you're actually transferring. Uh, because uh, uh, the, this, this whole uh, Veritas is, um, is uh, the antivirus uh, software package. It, it is all about source code and is about a brand. Um, so, so that is obviously what was from an IP law perspective of what you wanted to, uh, to transfer. However, if um, on top of that, you would uh, transfer the R&D department, you would transfer the marketing department, you would um, transfer the whole organization of uh, this antivirus software production and roll out uh, on all the logistics and the, uh, the security department uh, who, who needs to make sure this, uh, this software does what it, it is supposed to do, then uh, if if you add up all these elements, then suddenly you have a going concern. Uh, going concern, you're transferring from the US into, into Ireland. And that uh, obviously creates a totally different definition of intangibles because suddenly you add uh, an embedded workforce to the, uh, so you add to the IP law uh, intangibles, you add uh, the embedded workforce, the marketing department, the uh, security department, the sales department, um, you add to the, uh, the whole uh, transfer to Ireland, you, you add the 
the synergies and the, the premium which typically is attached to a company if you put all these ingredients together as a going concern and, and typically accountants call that goodwill. Um, but, but yeah, from a, a pure narrow definition of intangibles, goodwill typically was falling outside the definition of intangibles. As a consequence, uh, what you saw happening in, in Veritas, the Veritas case is, uh, is very illustrative to that, uh, to all these offshoring uh, structures, is that the legislation, in, in not only in terms of the OECD guidelines, but also in, in terms of what was the definition of intangibles um, in, the, in the internal revenue code, uh, was very uh, narrowly defined. So actually you could argue it was just uh, the source code and it was the brand which was transferred to Ireland. And hence, what you, what you see happening is, uh, is the, uh, in this particular case, the, uh, the corporate claimed what they transferred was worth 118 million. Well, here you see on, on top of this slide, you see the counter offer the IRS was making. Well, the IRS said, well, you know, I, I see what you transferred from an IP law perspective, but I want to add um, all, the, all the embedded workforce. I want to add uh, the, the goodwill component and I want to put a yellow ribbon around it and, and do a valuation of a going concern. Well, subsequently, 118 million, mind you, becomes 2.5 billion. Uh, so, a lot of the, uh, the 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 difference in the valuation techniques has nothing to do with the the metrics of uh, a calculator. It has everything to do with what is the defined uh, what is the definition of intangibles. In, the, uh, in this specific case and, and what, uh, what we learned, and that this is not different from the um, old um, section 482 rules on transfer pricing when you transfer an IP like this to Ireland. But we also have seen that in the OECD guidelines, um, the, the definition of intangibles was relatively limited in, in how it was defined. So at, as a consequence, uh, and that, that's the verdict uh, in this particular case as well, uh, the, there was a very legalistic approach taken on um, the definition of intangibles. So again, intangibles were only the source code and the brand name which were transferred. And of course, there was a uh, two separate planes with uh, one with the security people um, leaving the U.S. and heading for Ireland. And there was another plane uh, with the marketing department heading to Ireland. But they were not part of the deal uh, because uh, they could have fired the people in the U.S. They could have hired the people in Ireland. So in a, in a narrow definition of intangibles, uh, it was also very understandable uh, that uh, the, the court ruled as they did uh, because the, 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 the uh, definition of intangibles was very limited in the, in, in the, in the case at hand based on the, um, the, the law and regulations in place at that point in time. There's about 25 of these cases uh, and they all look very awkward. And why do they look awkward? Because, well, simply the, the value uh, for Ireland buying something in Ireland and Bermuda and Cayman, and, and, and all, the, all these locations are in that sense the same. Um, they all are all a factor 10 to even 100 of the claim the IRS put, put on, uh, on the value because the IRS had this yellow ribbon philosophy and they felt it was a whole going concern leaving the country uh, which was obviously um, uh, debated and uh, challenged by by the taxpayer um, 
what what has changed and i i know we are going to be addressing that uh, if in today's uh, if in today's valuation we look at onshoring and we had very interest, interesting discussions with uh, tax authorities as well as uh, the ministries of finance as well as with uh, with corporates on this um, the the governments has, have woken up on cases like this. They said, oh, if, if I move something for 100, which has a, a, a fair market value, if I look at the enterprise value of 100, and, and corporates can, can get away with migrating it to Ireland for 20, that doesn't seem to be very uh, fair. So, so let's change the legislation. Uh, so what, what has happened, and, and this is just two illustrations, and in uh, uh, 2017, the OECD changed its guidelines. And what, are, what do the guidelines say? It says, well, we don't necessarily like a purchase price allocation as a good base for valuing an intellectual property. Um, but we, uh, if you transfer something which is legally protected or protectable in combination with goodwill related elements uh, or and or a workforce uh, that basically creates a, a, a drag along and tag along kind of arrangement and and as a consequence in situations like that you need to look at the, the uh, enterprise wide value uh, so that's that's again is it a, a, a quant quantitative approach? No, it's very much uh, how does the transferred object gets defined from a, um, a tax uh, law and regulations perspective. Uh, the U.S. basically uh, has has been looking at at it from the same perspective. So in the 2017 U.S. tax reform, uh, they basically have uh, redefined intangibles to include workforce, to include goodwill, uh, to include uh, anything which is not in terms of value attached to tangible assets. Well, that means basically everything, everything which is left in terms of value gets ch chimed in. So if you move something now, it, it suddenly gets to become a very big value closer to the 2.5 billion. Um, Alessandro has a question. Let me put that on this screen. Uh, Alessandro, you're saying the court is underestimating the importance to re-evaluate uh, re intangibles or buy-in payments when the value was highly uncertain when the transaction took place, new intangibles. Moreover, that's probably a mismatch between the Irish view where value is created and where the intangible returns must be attributed and uh, US views. Um, so the, yeah, let me try to understand your question because it's a very long sentence and I'm not entirely sure. So the value was highly uncertain when the transaction took place. So the, 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 that's, uh, I, I would say, uh, an economist perspective uh, to say, okay, there's a high uncertainty on the full value. So why, uh, why account for the full value and uh, apply a probability factor that the, the one who uh, acquires it um, still has to make it happen in terms of uh, running that business at the same level of profitability. So, um, yeah, I, th I think that's, uh, that, that's a fair point. Uh, uncertainty will throw you into the basket uh, to talk OECD of hard to value intangibles. And that means you get uh, probabilities involved in, in your valuation. Um, there's another question, but before I jump into that, let me give you one example. Uh, Microsoft uh, bought, bought a Geico company in Israel um, for um, 
and they bought the shares in that company for uh, 90 million dollars quite quite recently um, they had a purchase price allocation which has of the 90 million about 26 million is um, the the value of the intangibles and we're going to move the intangibles from the acquired company to Microsoft Israel for 26 million and uh, that that was uh, sort of challenged by the tax inspector in Israel who said yeah but you just bought something for 90 million that was the whole enterprise um, now you're claiming suddenly based on a purchase price allocation that the IP value in that company you acquired was only 26 so uh, that was brought in front of the uh, the central district court in Israel and the, they they analyzed the case and said well basically the, uh, the legacy business you acquired became an empty corporate shell after you moved the um, the intangibles um, the, the source code to Microsoft Israel leaving only a client list and some minor assets behind in the acquired company so ultimately the court ruled in that particular case that uh, maybe not uh, the value of the transferred IP and everything around it was 90 million but certainly after um, a short a few uh, adjustments was at least worth 80 million dollars uh, so suddenly you see um, and a, a case where the, the total package, um, the, 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 the transfer of one component of IP uh, creates a drag along and tag along arrangement in terms of valuations. Uh, basically the court looked at the before and after situation. You acquire something for 90, you move everything except the client list uh, out, out of that company and that means um, basically uh, close to 90 million of value was was being migrated so uh, my point uh, is that that the rules of the game have changed because uh, governments felt that the offshoring um, uh, where the enterprise value was 100 for 20 because you only in in the narrow definition transfer IP rights worth 20 was creating a lot of leakages. The funny thing is that happened quite a lot and uh, the corporates be because of a very narrow definition of intangibles were uh, in a lot of cases uh, getting it their way. That meant they were honored by the courts under the old rules uh, to uh, count 20 as the exit uh, charge uh, leaving for example, the US. The, the 2017 change is kind of interesting and that's part of what we want to address also in the breakout sessions. Um, a lot of the in intellectual properties brought offshore, now the rules have changed and everyone says, okay, now the rules have changed, uh, let's, let's bring it back home uh, after BAPS happened in, uh, in, in the Final reports was published uh, um, end of 15, beginning of uh, 16, but also the US tax reform was, uh, was moving to a wider definition of intangibles. And suddenly a lot of these intangibles came, uh, came, came on tour again. And guess what? Uh, at, at the enterprise wide value. So uh, my, my essential comment uh, is on, on the lessons learned here is uh, something worth 100 was was let go by by governments and although they didn't like it uh, even the courts honored that position for 20 now today's enterprise value of that same package uh, you brought offshore might be 300 now you bring it onshore again and suddenly the value is 300 why because the, the, the governments have changed the rules of the game. Uh, quite a few cases in, in favor of the, of the corporate. 
So they they let go a step up and base free of tax, uh, uh, both on the offshoring as well as on the onshoring trail, which was you analyze it that way, uh, then you are somewhat surprised that the legislator was uh, was making that move uh, uh, to, uh, to broaden the definition of intangibles. Um, there's another question, uh, the US 2009 changes related to cost sharing is the point in time where goodwill I think that's right. I think the 2009 changes to the, the cost sharing regs uh, are, are obviously a, a tipping point where one element was was uh, quite important for, for the IRS uh, that, that, for example, uh, platform IP, right? so if Microsoft would move its platform to Ireland, for example, was assumed to have an indefinite lifetime. Uh, so suddenly there was certain features added to it. Uh, that's a very technical term of saying, well, whatever old crooked platform Microsoft uh, built in the first instance on which they released all sorts of new versions uh, stays valid and st has a, a platform value uh, until um, uh, and, and indefinitely. And, uh, and that's obviously a big statement for platforms which come and go all the time but the underlying assumption on the, on those racks is that uh, you move the platform it it remains uh, valuable and, and the us has a system where five years down the road they look if you transfer to an intangibles they look back and say did the value you transferred at and not generate more cash than anticipated for the one who bought it outside the US because if it did, we need to apply a commensurate with income and, and tax you for the difference. And that, by the way, is only working one way. So it only goes up, it never goes down. So this is uh, the, the story uh, on um, the offshoring of intangibles until say, the time BAPS reports became final, and, and then the onshoring game we seem to be in right now. Uh, would there be any questions uh, from the panelists uh, who would like to jump in? Any points? Hans, any uh, points you want to raise? Um, just looking in the agenda whether I have to do it here or later. Um, or that what I can tell, uh, yeah, what we see about, about onshoring. But I think, Steve, we have to do that in the, in the later session, in the breakout, isn't it? But I can perhaps already say a little bit here. In a few, in a few states, you, you discussed the... the, the, the the situations from offshoring to onshoring, why offshoring and why onshoring, and uh, what you see happening is that that yeah, although the fact that you, as you described, that you take an idiot situation actually a, a benefit twice, but onshoring is still apparently in a lot of states possible. Um, and, and the only thing here I can say, Steve, is that, that because we will do it a little bit later, a little bit more detail, is that in the EU, whenever you do onshoring, I'm a lawyer, not an economist, so you have to deal with, of course, the DEX 6 rules. But in principle, uh, it, 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 it is a possibility to do that route. However, keep in mind, yeah, the, the, economic, the economic, economic aspects, as you would always deal with it, um, I'm not familiar in, it's, it's also a question of valuation and how you deal with it. In my experience until now, I have a recent case in Bulgaria with respect to intellectual property royalties. Um, the state that takes a full legal position. So they don't look at value at all, they look at 
the all the typical things like substance, uh, real economic activity, and uh, whatever more. And um, so the the economic approach is probably phase two, but it's it's clear that phase two will arrive sooner or later. Yeah. The, yeah. the, 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 the interesting the interesting point in the in the Microsoft Israel case was that, that Microsoft basically said, "Well, yeah, we we offered 90 million for it." But um, a, a big chunk, say two-thirds of that value, was really uh, synergies we expected to, to earn uh, money on uh, at the level of Microsoft Israel at a later point, huh? which also uh, was uh, the, the, uh, probably the background of this purchase uh, uh, price allocation, where only one-third of the value was attributable to uh, the uh, the intellectual property. Uh, so if if you buy something and you say, okay, I'm I'm willing to pay 90 million, uh, but the 60 million, uh, I I need to use the technology I'm buying on my own business uh, to gain uh, synergies. Um, then obviously you you might find yourself in a in a reasonable case in in. In this particular Israel case, the, the court denied that and basically says there's no benefit um, in, in terms of uh, synergies. Uh, the court, I'm reading out loud here, ultimately rejected Microsoft's position regarding the value attributed to synergies and concluded that synergies must produce a unique advantage for the acquirer, in this case, Microsoft, in order to be excluded. So it, it has to produce a unique advantage for the acquirer. If you can't really um, uh, firm that up, then, then suddenly the 90 million will be the value uh, at which that IP is, or in this case, the 18 million uh, at which the IP is going to be, uh, be transferred. And so that, okay. that, that was a very well uh, supported uh, um, a verdict by the court. Um, it's, 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 changing in, it's changing in the Netherlands, but until now, I don't think there are two cases being decided with these kinds of economical approaches. In one of the cases I'm working on, the transfer pricing case, the tax administration is, is, is going into that direction, looking at economics, and uh, but still they try to, to, to achieve a, 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 a compromise here. Uh, which we don't like in this situation. But yeah, it's in the Netherlands, I haven't seen a court case like this yet, but, but I'm, I'm fully convinced, Dave, that what happens in Israel, that that will happen also in the Netherlands uh, sooner or later, because it's, it's, it's the second phase of dealing with these kind of economical differences. Okay. Um, I think uh, there's no more slides according to me. So this sort of ends this session a little bit earlier. Yeah, maybe we can take a five minute um, break so people can grab a cup of coffee, use the restroom and such. And then we will, I will separate everyone into their breakout sessions. Very good. Excellent. So we will start again, uh, join back again at five. So. Thanks. <laughs>